So good evening. Hello, everybody. And thank you for tuning into this second installment of the Black Baroque interview series. My name is Noemi Ndiaye. I am an assistant professor of English at the University of Chicago, and I'm the host of the Black Baroque series. This event is made possible by the generosity of the Court Theater, the Committee on Theater and Performance Studies, the English Department, the Department of Romance, Languages and Literature, as well as the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture. Most importantly, I would like to thank our featured artist, Keith Hamilton Cobb for joining us today, as well as my accomplice and partner in design, Gabriel Randall uh, Bent, and U Chicago PhD candidate, Brandy Williams, our wizard who, with her skills and patience, ensured that this event would run smoothly. I am delighted to introduce the second artist of this series, Keith Hamilton Cobb. I encourage you, uh, our spectators, to peruse Keith's very rich uh, website at length. It is linked on the registration page of the Black Baroque series. For now, let me just say briefly that uh, Cobb graduated from an NYU's Tisch School of the Arts with a BFA in acting. He has appeared in classical and contemporary roles on regional stages countrywide. Many of you remember him in the role of Tier Anasazi in the science fiction series uh, Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda, as Noah Kiefer on All My Children, as Damon Porter for the CBS daytime drama The Young and the Restless, and as Quincy Abrams for the Logo Network series Noah's Ark. Many of you also know that Keith's true love is the theater, stage acting, and live performance, especially Shakespearean performance. His regional theater credits include such venues as the Actors Theater of Louisville, the Shakespeare Theater of Washington, D.C., and the Denver Theater Center, performing such classical roles as Laertes in Hamlet, De Bolt in Romeo and Juliet, Tullus Ophidius in Coriolanus, Auburn in A Midsummer Night's Dream, as well as roles in such contemporary dramas as David Mamet Race, August Wilson's Jit Jitney, and Lynn Nottage's Ruined. Although the American Moore project started in 2012, Cobb showcased uh, the play in 2015. American Moore reckons with the impossible task of staging Othello today, a task which African-American stage actors are nonetheless inexorably pressed to perform on a regular basis. Since then, the show directed by my uh, former colleague, Kim Wield, has been produced with talkbacks, among other places, at the Plaza Theater in Boston, the Anacostia Playhouse in DC, off-Broadway at Cherry Lane Theater uh, in Manhattan in 2019, and on many college campuses across the country. And soon you will see why. Keith has spoken about his work. Um, he spoke about his work just a few weeks ago, actually, at the Shakespeare Association of America annual conference, as well as at the Shakespeare Theater Association annual conference. For his role in American Moore, Keith has won the 2015 Odalco Award for Best Solo Performance and the 2018 Elliot Norton Award for Outstanding Solo Performance. The play has garnered great academic acclaim. It is part of the permanent collection of the Folger Shakespeare Library. For many Shakespeare scholars, myself included, it has become very hard to teach Othello without pairing it with American Moore, which is now a new classic. And as of last year, it is available in print with Matthew and Drama. We are extremely fortunate to receive Keith Hamilton Cobb at UChicago, well, at UChicago today. Thank you, Keith. Absolutely, thank you. It's good to be here. So I'm just going to say a few words about the play and then we'll, we'll dive uh, right into the interview. This 75 minutes long play has spectators, us, sit in the audition room with Keith as he auditions to get cast as Othello. We hear his conversation with the young, inexperienced and overconfident, although well-meaning, perhaps, white male director who thinks he knows everything about the play and is incapable of listening, even though he really should. And that is something we are going to see right now uh, with a short clip uh, from the show. So let me just find the clip. And share it with everybody. Take a breath, Negro. All right. 
First up, take a bite of numbers. A little white man is asking me if I have any questions about being a large black man. <laughs> Enacting the role of a large black man in a famous Shakespeare play about a large black man, which for the past 50, 60 years or so has been more or less wholly the province of large black men. <laughs> no. <I don't... laughs> I ain't got no questions. But you should. You ought to have nothing but questions. And yet, you know what? I bet the most pressing question he had for me was, how tall are you? He ought to have nothing but questions, and yet he doesn't. As spectators, we hear everything Keith thinks. We hear everything he wanted to respond in the moment and everything he ultimately said. And in that choice, uh, we see you, Keith, remediating one of the frustrating features of uh, Shakespeare's play, one of the most frustrating features of Shakespeare's play, namely the fact that um, in Othello, the hero, the protagonist is not given the kind of asides and soliloquies that Iago has, and those enable him to enjoy a special, a privileged relation to the audience. Your use of dramatic form reassigns that special relation to Othello, which is deeply satisfying. What we don't hear or know is what the white director will ultimately do at the end of the play. And of course, that is intentional. Spectators move between subject positions throughout the play, being cast in turn as Keith friends, foes in confidence, as well as potential allies. Ultimately, American Moore tells us that this is our story, that there is no opting out of the great American racial drama, but we can choose the role that we want to play in it as long as we are ready to do the work the work of listening, and the work of repair. This play explores everything Othello means to African-American actors, to actors today, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the fragile. But it also uses Shakespeare's Othello as a blueprint to reveal the ways in which systemic, systemic racism pervades the theater industry and by extension, American society today. I will now ask uh, Keith a few questions and then we will open the floor uh, for 30 minutes long Q&A with the audience. So audience members, please do drop your questions in the chat box, not in the, um, sorry, not in the chat box. I meant in the Q&A box. Sorry, the chat box is for uh, social purposes only. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, there should also be a box at the bottom right of your screen, which you can click in order to get a live transcript of the event. So feel free to do so to get live captions. And as a reminder, if you haven't had the time to watch the recording yet, uh, the link is included at the bottom of the email that you receive in order to that you received in order to tune into this webinar, and it will remain live and valid uh, throughout Friday. So if you missed it, you can still uh, watch American More uh, tonight through Friday. Okay. Now, Keith. Uh, I'm, I'm turning to you and uh, just to give you a little bit of background about the, you know, the, the concept of the Black Baroque series. Um, I want to say that two weeks ago when we had the first installment and we received uh, the French choreographer Bintou Dembélé, I explained a little bit what I had in mind with the, this, this weird phrase, right, the Black Baroque. It sounds good, but what is it about? So the Black Baroque has uh, two valences. On the one hand, because the Baroque period stretching from the Renaissance to the beginning of the 18th century is the age which launched the colonial project, the invention of uh, whiteness, you know, the faded invention of whiteness and the racialization of blackness, the idea of a black Baroque is an oxymoron. The relation between the Baroque and blackness is always already fraught. But on the other hand, to the extent that the Baroque aesthetics is based on beautiful irregularity and characterized by complexity, surprise, dizzying folds, metamorphoses and illusions, perpetual movement, self-referentiality, and a lavish profusion of carefully contrived ornaments, there are deep affinities between the Baroque and the aesthetic embraced by many Afro-diasporic artists and theater makers today. In American Moore, you do highlight uh, those affinities when you talk about uh, the poetry of Shakespeare. 
I'm going to play another short clip that will uh, make that obvious for our spectators. Sharing the screen with everybody. Then, <coughs> Willie walked in. <laughs> and, and we were only just acquainted, uh, he, she, it, they, and I, when I realized that these characters each had this depthless reservoir of emotion already running around within them. And whenever they but opened their mouths, they couldn't help but give voice to even the most vile of pronouncements in the most beautiful of ways. Uh, the, the, the things like, uh, would he were wasted, marrow, bones and all, that from his loins no hopeful branch may spring to cross me from the golden time I look for. How many times have you wanted to say some shit like that about a motherfucker? <laughs> and suddenly, I could! Without apology, with every politically incorrect fiber of my animal self, I could say, he made me mad! To see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet and talk so like a waiting gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds. God save the mark! I could say that <laughs> as well as anyone, and infused with every ounce of my glorious African American emotional arrogance, it would sink. It would sing. You reinforce that point later in the play when you say, I love Shakespeare. I love the sound of his voice. I love to hear him speak through me. I love him just as I love you, Black man, who you speak through me too, unquote. So can you tell us a little more about this love, about this singing, about those affinities between Blackness and the Baroque, which are instantiated in this case through Shakespeare? What is it that makes Shakespeare and Blackness so compatible for you? You know, and, and, and geez, thank you again for doing this. I am, I am it just, it's just perpetually and insanely moved by how there has been this whole academic track that has picked up and run with this play, you know, in a way that the American theater has not quite caught up to. But I just wanted to say, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that we are engaging in this discussion because the discussion is so very important. So I always, I always want to say that first, you know, the North American continent, the population of this continent is a family. Uh, it is insanely and horribly dysfunctional. But if we can use that metaphor, it is a family, you know, and there is factionalism within the family. It does not work and it will probably ultimately destroy itself. But anything within that family is influenced by the family around it, you know, and the way, unless, you, unless you leave, you are going to be influenced. And that family was influenced by Europe. You know, the, all, all, all of all European ideology descended, came across the oceans with, 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 with Puritans and seekers of, 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 of various freedoms, you know, and created this. And, 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 and we are a part of that. So I always find it, you know, people, people ask, well, what is it, what is it, what is your affinity with Shakespeare? And I say, well, it's, an, it's the same affinity that anybody else has where we, where we run into problems is that I'm not purporting or dictating how, how it be used, who gets to use it, who, who does it right, you know, who can, who can you, I'm not, I'm not weaponizing it, I'm not using it as a tool of oppression uh, or, or, or as a, a way to define myself and my culture. You know, I grew up in American schools. I was exposed to this as an American student. And, 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 and because I had a, a, a tendency towards letters, you know, this grew in me. I, 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 I think that answers the question. 
does. It does. And it's such a good answer. I mean, I, I love hearing you talk about it because one issue we are encountering, you know, uh, folks who teach Shakespeare in relation to Blackness, Black Shakespeareans, but generally scholars interested in thinking about Shakespeare and race, is that uh, a lot of students, especially BIPOC students that we would like to reach out, somehow when they arrive in college already feel that Shakespeare is not for them, right? That it's not part of their legacy. And so hearing you talk about it uh, this way is actually really helpful and, and moving. And it, it's, it, it's an interesting insidious thing because it is both inadvertent and by design mm -hmm. that that happens to them, mm -hmm. right? It is, it is the, the, the design is so old and so vast and so meticulously wrought, right? That the, the, the power structure does not, not, does not re realize that it's operating out of this, 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 this entrenched and, 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 and powerful, powerful structure. And yet, as you say, as we get, as we, as, as, as the students reach college, they've already been taught and you can't point at anybody. You can't point at a single person and say, that's, that's, that's your fault. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, it would be easier if we could, but, 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 but the structure is, is, is so multifaceted and so injurious. Yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a systemic issue. And the question is, where do we start where? Well, I think American Moore is a good, is a great place to start, you know, <laughs> if we can get students, high school students to see the play. And I know you've been talking to students on high school campuses as well, right? You're doing that work of reaching out to them. Yeah. Uh, then this is, this is a place to start trying to change the systemic. Okay, I had um, I have a, a question about uh, it's actually a follow up question. Uh, it's um, it's about what the Baroque um, you know what the Baroque slash what Shakespeare does for you. As in, you have a remarkably wide uh, repertoire, and as an artist, I was wondering what can you do with Shakespeare that you couldn't do as neatly with a more contemporary play. Well. Like it says in uh, American Moore, like like the, the, the character expressed in American Moore, I found there's that part of the play that is it, it is is autobiographical. Much of it is 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 whimsical and, and licensed, but uh, there is that part that is my. It all stems ultimately from some experience of mine, and one of those experiences that is very much mine is that I learned that I was not supposed to express myself in the voice that was given to me to, 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 to do that very thing. The, that something in the culture feared the sound of my voice, the depth of my voice, the size of my body, the color of my skin, all those things together. You know, and again, we talk about this meticulous construction. That criminalization started ages ago so that people exercising that, people, people expressing that now, people reacting to, to black men in public don't know what they're reacting to or why necessarily, right? That's how insidious it is. But for me, I realized that that wasn't going to work. I mean, you know, I mean, mothers and fathers give their, 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 their children this talk where they say, you watch how you speak, you watch your voice, you watch how you use it. And there was a period where, where that made me look absolutely psychotic because I was trying to censor as I spoke. You know, I had this in the back of my mind that there was a problem with how I expressed myself. So I better keep an eye on that while I'm talking. And I wasn't able to do it really very, very, very well. Still don't. And when I began to stop reading Shakespeare and, and, and saying the words, understanding how the verse worked, what by and large the words meant, because there is a, there is a colloquial context that we have to get used to for, for, for you know, a, a lot of this language. I realized that all these characters, whenever they opened their mouths, they, they got to express the utmost emotion in these things that they said. And it gave me a place to channel that, that emotion, that a contemporary play, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't do that with Eugene O'Neill. I can't, <laughs> yeah, I can't. <laughs> I see the, 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 the emotional excess is something that, that really appealed to you. Yes, I can yeah. totally see that. Um, and is there, is this, is this specific to Shakespeare or are there other, you know, contemporary playwrights, uh, 
contemporary to Shakespeare who inspire you as well? Like, if you like emotional excess, I'm thinking Marlowe, I could see you as Tamburlaine. Yeah, yeah, Tamburlaine just blathers on and on and on and on for four hours. You know, I don't know, I don't know about Tamburlaine, but it, it, it raises an interesting point. I'll tell you, Noemi, um, there's, you know, there are some, I think about 50% of Shakespeare's plays are wonderful. And I think the other half I never have to see again. Right? I, I really, you know, I don't, I don't think they're all equal, equally sublime. You know, those that are, are sublime beyond, beyond sublime. They're just absolute genius and I love them and I will love them forever. Um, of the early modern playwrights that are contemporaries of, of, of that playwrights, you know, it's like, I don't know where they came up with this pentametric verse structure, but all of his contemporaries, when you read their play, seem to be trying to cram this stuff into that, that structure, right? Mm -hmm. And it never quite, quite works. The, the, the uh, uh, theatrical convention of the day was plot driven, right? It wasn't character driven, right? Characters were archetypes to push a plot, you know, and there were big holes in that plot and you weren't supposed to care. And I imagine the early modern audiences didn't. And I just think that when Shakespeare started to write or maybe not when he started, but as he began to experiment with, with stuff and, and pick up steam, he was doing stuff that none of his contemporaries do. And I don't, you know, I can, I can read Ford or, or Fletcher or, you know, Kid and get, 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 get something out of it, but it's a chore. It's a chore because they're not, it doesn't flow. They're not doing what he does. He was a particular kind of genius, which is why we continue to talk about him. So if somebody, if somebody says to me, you know, we're doing Revengers tragedy, do you want to do it? I, you know, I'm not going to say no, but I'm going to be wishing they said, we're doing, we're doing Richard II and we want you to play Richard. Mm -hmm. I can see that. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because, because that is, I mean, when you listen to that, that is the, that is, that is the most insanely beautiful poetry. Some of the most insanely beautiful poetry ever written. As far as I'm concerned, you know, mm -hmm. kid, kid doesn't have that, you know. All right, that's that's a very good reason to stick to Shakespeare. That makes a lot of sense. So those were my questions about the Baroque, you know, to as a, as a way of getting us started. And now I have some questions that are really specific to American Moore and to, and to that political project out there. So I wanted to ask about the development of the play, because what we see now from our perspective is the, the triumph of American Moore, right? How much it was needed and, and all the great, the important work that it's doing. Um, but it cannot, because this was a radical project, it cannot possibly have been easy to develop it. So can you tell us a little bit about the developmental arc of the piece and the, just the development history of, of this project? Yeah, it's, 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 it's still not easy. You talk about triumph, and as I said at the beginning, this, this uh, academic conversation that continues to burgeon around this play is thrilling. But in terms of putting the play before audiences, it is still uh, uh, just a fight to get the industry to see this as, 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 as this valuable thing that is a tool for change, a tool for conversation, a tool to blow the conversation wide open. You know, several, several of them. You know, there are conversations about race, but there's also conversations about how we're making theater. Is the theater any good? What is it incumbent upon us to do to make it better? And there are all conversations we should be having. And this play sits at the nexus of all of that. Uh, in, in many respects. Um, so it continues to be a, 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 a struggle. Uh, and there are reasons for that. Um, when I started in, I mean, it might've been 2011, 2010, there had been any number of, I call it a fellow in the ether. If you're, if you're a large black actor who does Shakespeare, people are going to talk to you about, about Othello. And there had been, you know, various encounters and conversations with that character that had, you know, for, uh, as American War says, for many, many of the wrong reasons. And I can remember I had, I had auditioned for one uh, and there had been absolutely no discussion. I mean, I, I was 50, 49, you know, 50. And so half my life had been spent as an actor and, 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 and because Othello is what it is, so a certain part of that had been spent contemplating this role. 
Uh, and there was no conversation. I, was, I, was, I, I, I took the audition because I needed a job because actors are often out of work. Not that I, I have any, I, I don't really want to be this guy. I don't really want to play this character. That's, a, that's, a, that's another discussion. But I knew that then and I, I needed a job. So I went and I, I, I remember having to read uh, It Is The Cause uh, just as an audition piece. And I thought, you know, this really is at the end of the play. It takes some, takes some emotional track to get there. And uh, I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm gonna give you just out of context, but this is what they wanted to see. And there was no conversation with me about well, what do you think? What do you think about this character? What would you like to do, you know? And you know, I, 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 it was about that time, you know, late forties into my early fifties where I started thinking I'm grown now. I am a, a, a no level a neophyte to anything in this, in, in this country certainly not the work that I do. And I deserve engagement, you know, and, and that is a problem with the theater, right? That the actors are the, the laborers in a capitalist system. They are at the bottom, you know, the artists you always get, you know, they, they do the work and somebody else, some, some producer takes the money and actors are at the bottom of that. You know? And I left that audition with, with with, with, with those thoughts in my mind. And there was another one not too long, not too, 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 too long after where I was auditioning for an Oberon and a, a Theseus uh, for a reputable theater. And the director was somebody, you know, I think I was, I, 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 I would, I would peck him at an age where I, you would say I had been uh, working in my career probably about as long as he'd been alive. You know? And he had, he, he said, I, I need to see this and this and this and this and this. And he gave me sides and all the things that he wanted to see, he redacted from the sides because he wanted short auditions. I didn't want to spend a lot of time with anybody. And I, I, I thought, okay, well, you know, everything that you want to see Shakespeare gave you, but it's not here anymore. So now it's incumbent upon me to sort of act this for you. Um, he had, you know, you're doing Hippolyta scenes and Titania scenes. And he had a reader there who was a, a 60 some odd year old man, if he was a day. And uh, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, if, 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 if you are uh, trying to create the, the fairy king and queen and the Theban king and queen as somehow other, otherwise gendered, that's fine, but it takes time, right? It takes time and work and communication. Let's get in there and do that. Actors will give you that, but you have to give them the resource to do it, you know. For now, I had this man who I'm supposed to act these, these old men who I'm supposed to act these love scenes with. And I, you know, I, I, I did my thing and they sent me out, out of the room and, and, and left me out there for a while. I think they kind of forgot that I was out there. And a monitor came out a little bit later and dismissed me. And I had been used to that. I had been used to the uh, 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 rude manners of our system of, 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 of auditioning actors, I, what, the, what, what, what that is. And I, you know, I was old enough to be able to put that behind me. And in, in, in whatever way, I was inconsolable on this particular day, for whatever reason, I just couldn't. Those two auditions back to back had created this, put me in this space that I couldn't be talked to. And somebody said, you need to write this. And I wasn't, in, I said, I wasn't interested in writing a solo show. Uh, American War ultimately turns out to be a, a, a play for two characters, but at the time, it looked like it was going to be a solo show, and I was, I was in, in deep resistance of that. But there was nothing else to do but write to channel this confluence of uh, anger, rage, uh, it's creative paroxysm of, of uh, realization of where I was as a, 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 an American theater professional and as an, Amer an African-American man and realizing that they could not be separated, that they were a thing, mm -hmm. right? And, and for what, in whatever way that that revel revelation was profound, it caused me to begin to, to pen this piece. And when we started to put it in front of people, uh, uh, just this broad cross-section of humanity spoke back to it from across all social, sexual, uh, racial uh, spectrums. Uh, and I realized that oh, this isn't just about me. This is about humanity. This is about all of us who feel othered, who feel, you know, who, who every one of us cries, see me, hear me, understand me, 
appreciate what I have to give. I only have this to give, so I'm giving it, you know, appreciate that. You know? uh, and, 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 and so people were able to speak back with thoughts and instances of their own lives as they, as they, as they watched this piece. And it grew from there. That was a, a profound revelation as well. We realized, okay, this is everybody's play. And when people come to see it, they are moved to, 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 to talk back. They want to engage the post-show discussions because there's so much to talk about and it gives them the ability, it gives them a platform. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why it, 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 this process of getting it in front of a wider American audience uh, is 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 important and ongoing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, one question I had, you know, when I was thinking about the development history of the play, is about the arc of it, right? Because when you when you started working on American Moore, I think you mentioned twenty eleven or twenty twelve. Um, President Obama was still uh, was still president, and we, as in some of us, uh, still lived in the post racial illusion bubble. American Moore made it uh, through the Trump presidency. And after the uprising of last summer, it's now entering its third administration. And, uh, and one thing we noticed in the course that I'm teaching right now, Black Shakespeare, and a lot of my students are actually uh, tuned in right now. Uh, but one thing we mentioned as we were reading various uh, adaptations is uh, of Othello is that often those adaptations are using the play that, that Shakespeare is providing them with to address a problem that is really specific to their own time and place, right? So often they are, those responses are attuned to the political climate in which they were created. So my question for you is about um, how the shifting political and racial climate of the, the last few years has affected the life of American more. Have you made changes? How have you responded to the you know, changing political climate? Well, I have not. We have not made changes responding to the climate. And I don't believe the climate has changed that much. You know, I think it was always there. I think that white America was scared into a, a realization that things were changing drastically. And there was this huge backlash to that, which ushered in the next administration and we are still living. And now stuff that, that people were just allowed to, to go about believing in ways that they were allowed to go about behaving, uh, uh, it, it all of a sudden became appropriate for them to voice it, for them to take a stance, for them to, take it, to double down on positions uh, uh, that are divisive, uh, and, uh, uh, hatreds, uh, individual needs, anti-altruistic ideology of all sorts. Um, and that's all been one thing. That's been the arc of one thing. It started with Barack Obama, but it really is just showing us who we are and who we have been. And um, American War speaks to that. You know, it speaks to, <clears throat> uh, the inability of privileged white culture to see beyond the veil of privilege you know, and to create beyond the veil of, 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 of privilege it is, it is extremely hard. And in the play, we fault nobody for that. I, 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 I always say there are no villains in this play. There are people with, 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 with limited tools, both of them have limited tools to get past this thing and they're operating in whatever, whatever way they can. It's nobody's fault what the ancestors have left us with here. You know, uh, we can make choices to move forward from here, but comfort is a really important thing and capitalism allows these divisions, keeps these divisions in place. And you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a separate discussion. But um, changes in the play have come about through uh, communicating with audiences from early on as we were in development. I mean, it's, it's, it's done, it's published now, so it's not going to, to change at this point, but uh, it, 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 in development, I was moved by the remarkable things that people would say, things that they, they saw that I didn't even see, you know, stuff in the play that I didn't even realize was there, mm. you know, and uh, my wanting to go back and drill down on that thing, to look at that thing that, that person saw and figure out how much of that is on the page and how much of that was how I acted it, how I performed it in that moment, you know. So that is where a lot of the evolution of the piece came from. Right. Can you give us an example of one thing you didn't know was there, but uh, an audience member told you, oh, there's that in the play. And you're like, yeah, that's right. That's good. Let's work with this. Uh, 
That's hard to do uh, specifically, you know, the, um, and, and, and when I begin to start to talk about what audience members say, I sound like I'm bragging because they said they have said really beautiful and profound things. Uh, one woman, white woman, she was, uh, I peg her maybe 70 years old or so, but, you know, the, very bright, very together. She stood up and said, I experience ageism and sexism every day. And when I watched this character navigate which fights to pick, which battles to fight, what to leave alone, what to forgive, how to move on, I, I was one with that because that's my life, you know, as this woman, as this American, 70 year old American woman. We, all, we do it to everybody. We take what we need of people or what we, what, what we uh, 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 believe from our perspective is the value that they have, you know? And that's, that's nurtured. And the process of pushing back, of resisting that in the individual is about introspection, is about all of us getting up every day and doing the inventory, right? What am I doing? How am I showing up today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, it's very hard because because the because the world is a scary place. And certainly right now we're looking around and everybody's got deer like deer in the headlights. Nobody's got time to, to deal with the, you know, to deal with the warm fuzzy stuff. Yeah, that's nice, but I got I gotta get from A to B, you know. And that's uh, that's that's real. That that story, that anecdote is really beautiful. That that is a wonderful comment. And my next question was actually about audiences. So perfect segue. Um, I wanted to I wanted to ask about audience responses generally, but you know, in, in a in a targeted way though. So the audience is the the third character of the play, right? You go through a great length to describe the relation that must exist between Keith, the character, and his audience. I'm just, I'm going to read uh, that, that note regarding staging and stage directions, which is at the beginning uh, of the Methuen edition, uh, and then get back to my question. So note regarding staging and stage directions. This is a play that requires the sole character on stage to address several different amorphous entities, some that are not physically present and an audience, another amorphous entity that very much is. Some instruction regarding when to address whom will be obvious in the text. Other of it is explicitly stated in the stage directions, but much must remain the discovery of the actor and director from production to production, influenced by stage and seating configurations, lighting and other non-static factors from one production to the next. In this discovery, the audience should and will find itself playing many parts, it is not intended that this process leave them in comfort, but throughout, the actor must return to them often with love and an open heart. He must return to engage them as traveler on this road with him, because that is what, in designing to sit and experience this play, they have agreed to be, most of them. The actor asks early on that they trust him, perhaps not with words, but by confiding in them. If his tale is to be heard and more important, believed, he must take responsibility for their trust. This does not mean that he should mitigate any of his well-earned emotional expression for what should he be without it. His audience will most clearly see his regard and responsibility for them in the ways that he returns to them." End of quotation. And so, of course, this, this very rich relation, which, which hinges on, on care, on responsibility, and on trust, those are your keywords, that in, in that relationship, we find an echo of Othello's final monologue when he asks spectators to speak of me as I am, nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice, unquote. Uh, Shakespeare scholar Ian Smith has beautifully shown that the question of whether audiences are able to do that for Othello is in itself fraught because audience responses are always traversed with uh, racial tensions. So my question for you, Keith, is how have your many audiences over the last six years answered this call and faced this responsibility? Right? How, um, maybe just a more refined um, version of that question, how does the demographic composition of your audience play into those dynamics? Um, and you know, what are some, some memorable ways in which spectators have, have responded 
to this, um, this responsibility that you're putting on them? There's a, that's a, there's a bunch of questions in there. Um, uh, Feel free to address whichever you want. Is, yeah, okay. The, the first thing I say is that certainly Ian Smith is right that, and, and, and we've talked about this, that it is, it is, it is well nigh impossible for, 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 for people to process a piece like this that isn't through, if, they, if, if they're white people looking at this play, through the lens of what they have been taught and nurtured to understand over generations, right? Or to take for granted over generations, just as, just as often, right? Um, so you never know exactly what, how people are interacting and, and what they're taking. Certainly the responses across the country, and as I say, across all demographics have been overwhelmingly positive. When, when they have not been, you tend not to hear from those people. I mean, there's the odd bad review, and I can tell you about some of those because they're interesting when you start to look at them. Um, uh, but most people are not gonna sit in the talk back where the, the mood of the room is overwhelmingly positive and start to say negative things. You know, just, you're not gonna hear from them. And, and that's a problem because I would like to talk to them too. And every once in a while we have that, we have, have, have that ability. Um, by and large, I find that, and we, we see this in life. If you, if you, any situation that you, you meet with compassion and kindness and ability will, will change the vibration of that situation. You know, it, it, just, it just will. And it, it, this, this works in American more. I thought if I could, the, the, the prologue, that, that piece where he is talking directly to the audience before he starts the audition was a late addition. You know, he we didn't we didn't have that in the play. And I said I have to ha I have to find a way to to have these people see me and understand me, understand that I am I I I I am I am I want to commune with them. I want them to come with me. I want to I want to embrace them. I want to take care of them. You know, and the natural tendency is for them to want to take care of me. And often often that works. Um, You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about what people have said. It's, it sounds like, I mean, it, you know, there was a, 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 a woman in Florida, old African-American woman who said she knows her father, her husband and her two sons better uh, for seeing this play. And I thought, you're somebody who knows them already. I mean, you, 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 you're 60 years old. You lived, you've lived a life in, 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 in Florida. You know, if you, 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 you know, you understand what's up against them and for you to show up and tell me you understand them better is striking uh, to me. Um, more than that, though, I think, I think, you know, it's not just, it's not just black people, it's people of, of, of all demographics seeing aspects of their lives for the first time, seeing the connective tissue and, and, and feeling in a profound way that it's real, right? feeling so very connected to this person and not knowing why. So it's jarring, right? It's jarring. First you show up and you're presenting, you're presenting an African-American man that they aren't expecting to see. They're expecting to see, they're not expecting to, 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 to hear him articulate in the way that he does, to play Shakespeare in the way that he does. They are thrown when he, 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 he reverts back to a vernacular that is, ah, there, that, that's, the, that's the guy we know. That, that sounds more like Eddie Murphy. You know? <laughs> but, then, but then just as quickly, it becomes, it becomes something else. And he is being completely available, right? He's, he, 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 he's stripping naked and saying, this is my heart. This is what's going on with me. And he does it in such a way that is viscerally moving, you know, and um, it's been proven to work. A quick follow-up question, still on the question of the audience. 
um, the the recording that you generously uh, generously shared with us was the directing of American Mora as a work in progress, right? It, it's not the final version. Uh, it was shot at the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse uh, at Shakespeare's Globe uh, in London as part of the Globe's Shakespeare and Race Conference. Um, so that was a, a conference with many American attendees, obviously, but I imagine there must have been some British audience members as well. Um, so I'm wondering whether you notice differences in responses in the UK uh, and in the US. Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's a couple of distinct ones. First of all, they, they are, they, they start, they're taught Shakespeare when they're five, you know, so they start very young. So you say gallop a pace and they already know what play you're in, right? They know immediately, you have to say two words and they know where you're going, right? Of any Shakespeare, any, any quote, you know, two words, three words that they know, right? So they were very tuned in, the British audience. They also are having their race problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and how they are, are, are navigating how they are uh, connected to, uh, what's the term? Uh, um, finance, money, uh, uh, financial differences, right? Um, uh, they're, 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 they're somewhat different uh, in, in what that they have, what they call the wind rush generation, which were uh, these people from the uh, Caribbean islands, uh, but an influence of immigrants from pretty much everywhere right now, right? As all of Europe is dealing with, you know, uh, global changes and, uh, so they are, they, they, you know, there's one, there's one thing that people like to do, which is to look over at the US and say, why wow, those people are messed up. You know, it's fascinating. You know, you could always say, yeah, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're a mess over there. But uh, you bring this to them and they have to realize that again, this is very much like the lives that they live in many, many respects. So they were very present with the play. They asked a lot of questions. Um, and we have tried to get it back there. We went back briefly for something. We were invited to a school uh, to, 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 to perform it. And so we were back there for, for, for a hot minute. But I would, we would very much like a, a, a West End run of this play. I think they would love it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, since we're on the other side of the pond right now, I'm going to stay there for my next question. <laughs> So um, when you and I were corresponding in order to prepare for this event, uh, at some point I, I, I referred to American Moore as a one-man show, and you very correctly told me, no, this is a play and this is a two-hander. Um, but I think the reason why I thought of the one-man show is because this is grounded in my experience as, as a French woman. I grew up in France. I moved to the U.S. when I was 25, and I went to acting school. <laughs> so the, the diversity problems that you're talking about, I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, but something I, I noticed is that a lot of young BIPOC actors in France, um, you know, stage actors, because of the diversity problem, because the casting directors just do not cast them because they lack imagination and because of systemic racism, have, I would say, over the last 15 years, pretty consistently turned to uh, the tradition of stand-up comedy and turn to the one man show as a form that enables them precisely to have that privileged connection to the audience and to talk about what the experience, always in comedic form, right? Because this is stand up comedy, uh, but to talk about it uh, to the audience directly in a country where just using the word race is considered racist, right? So I'm wondering whether, you know, whether that's, that's um, a performance tradition that is of interest to you, whether it played any role when you were thinking, you know, considering different formats for the work or just, you know, throwing it out there? <laughs> yeah, no, American more evolved organically. Uh, and I, I am not a comic. I am not, I, uh, you know, my, my, the people who know me say I'm very funny, but I am not a comic actor. I have never, I had no traction in Hollywood as somebody who could be funny on command, who could read you know, uh, you, you go to half hour auditions, auditions for sitcoms, and there are people who can come in the room and say nothing and make you laugh hysterically. They just have, you know, and I didn't have those tools, nor did I really want them. You know, I felt like any comedy that I have comes is born out of the humanity that, that the characters that I embodied 
uh, uh, would have. And that could be that could be Laertes, that could be Hamlet, that could be anybody. They're, they're, we as human beings are funny in moments, right? If we're being if we're being wholly human and, and multi-dimensional as, as 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 we are as 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 human animals. Um, so that's where my humor came from. But again, as you say, that requires the imagination of the person looking at you to see the value, to understand what use that's going to be to me, as opposed to, you know, I have to make a decision right now. So I'm going to go with that guy because, you know, he's, he's a B or C thing, uh, um, which speaks to, you know, I, I, I imagine it's global. I mean, it, 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 it's in France, I guess, to some extent it's, it, it's in the UK, but, but certainly here, this, the, the, the structure with which we build our product and it is product, right? It's not art, it's product. We're selling stuff. Uh, is perpetually compromising to the product because the process does not allow us the best of anything. You know, the, the picky, you know, at this, at, at, at this point, you're doing auditions online, right? You get some stuff and you, 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 you set up a camera and you send that into them. They never see you. They never know you. It's completely out of context. You're in some room, you know, and Somebody will look at that and either call you or discard it. They're very impersonal, right? And it never gives anybody the opportunity to actually do the work that the artists want to do, which is just give me, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's our Denison line in uh, her, 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 uh, her book, uh, uh, Babbitt's Feast. Uh, give me, uh, cry goes up from the, from the heart of the artist, give me the opportunity to do my very best. That's all an artist wants to do. You know, give me the space, give me the time, and I'll deliver something. I'll deliver something interesting. The competition, it becomes this, this entire, entire other thing. And it's competition not with just getting roles, but as we're experiencing with American more, with just getting it on the boards, getting it in front of people's eyes. You know? And that has, a, a, that, that, that has a great deal to do with what, what we were calling this uh, inadvertent harboring of racial biases right, about this work. right? I don't know. I don't know if this this work looks like it's indicting me. I don't want to be indicted, so I'm not going to go here. You can't take American Moore, put it in a theater, and sit to the left or the right of it and say, "Oh, there's this interesting black thing happening over there." You are in the firing line, right? And that is, I call it a a, a, a dangerous political play, and that's what it is. It frightens. It, it scares the shit out of people, you know, and and. To and it, and it makes for a very terrible business model because I'm going to these people who have their, their, their the, the gatekeepers who are white and saying, work with this play. And in one way or another, they're saying, no, no, we're not, we're not having that, you know? And oddly, what changes that is if it were Denzel's play, they would do it because then their capitalist ideology, their capitalist ethics sees the, sees the route to the money immediately. This is worth me being indicted <laughs> if I'm going to make money, right? I want to be a part of that. I want to ride that train. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's probably a conversation about several things, but we are certainly in our own way and creating a really uh, horrible brand of theater that doesn't seem to be any, any better than the country does as a whole. Okay, silly thought. Do you think that the, the pandemic might change something like is it going to be the you know the extreme test for the theater industry that is going to precipitate some kind of change mm, uh, only in as much as it changes the the the, the culture around it you know what i mean i i, I mean I, i feel like uh the pandemic uh coupled with george floyd has got a lot of people talking and and and, and convening all sorts of uh you know bipoc confabs and talking about creative justice and, 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 and what they're going to do and allyship statements, but they've all been hemorrhaging money for a year and a half. And when they can make it again, I think by and large, they're going to revert to the means that were tried and true before any of this stuff happened, right? They're going to go back to doing stuff the same way because it makes that money. This is about, we are a culture that is all about making money. You know, we have not, we do not, we, 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 we do not revere and nurture art as the Europeans do uh, on, on, on any level. It's not, it, 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 American culture is barbaric and, 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 and Philistine in, 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 in many respects, you know, and again, that's a separate discussion. But I think that the nation is in a process of, of devolution. It's, it's, um, 
it's going away. I don't, I don't know what, what this thing is we came through or where that ultimately goes, you know? And, and, and uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not optimistic, but as I say, everything goes with it. Everything within this, this, this frame goes where it goes. Theater is, 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 is the American theater is, has, has uh, endemic uh, racial biases because the country that it is in has them and has had them for hundreds of years for horrible reasons, reasons that no white American can own, right? There is deep guilt and nobody can take responsibility for, 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 for what, what this horror that was perpetrated here and continues to be capitalized on, right? Continues to be used right? as the structure to, 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 to advance some lives in, 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 in lavish privileged ways at the expense of others. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you square that, you know? And theater's just another, you know, I mean, we, we can have a whole separate talk about what, what, what American theater is doing, but in brief, you know, every, every regional theater you go to, people are getting paid, you know? The ticket taker doesn't care if you have a good show. The janitor doesn't care if you have a good show. The person in development doesn't care if you have a good show. They're getting a check so they can go home and raise their families. They've got a job, right? They're not thinking about making something wonderful. Art, art does, is, is, is no respecter of money. It does not interested in money. It's interested in beauty. It's interested in, 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 in depth and introspection and, 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 and the celebration of a wider humanity. You know? So it doesn't work here. It doesn't mean that the artist should stop. It doesn't mean, I mean, I can't do anything else. You know? <laughs> Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about stopping or not stopping. Um, one of our sponsors, the Court Theater, is actually in the process of developing a production of Othello that will open next fall. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, a number of uh, students who are here with us today uh, are taking this, this uh, course on Black Shakespeare, which is developed in partnership with, with Court Theater. So my question for you is about Othello, right, and how to do Othello today. Um, what we saw, you know, in our class when we were reading a number of um, adaptations of Othello, but also reading uh, some of the fabulous scholarship uh, that has been uh, produced in the field is that there is what could be called the Othello performance conundrum, right? On the one hand, the role of Othello cannot in 2021 be performed by a non-Black actor because erasing Blackness from the play is just unacceptable. On the other hand, uh, as American more clearly shows, the role of Othello is traumatic for most Black actors and uh, productions which merely, I'm quoting you, tell the story again without telling it better, only compound a free-floating racial prejudice. And this had led scholars like Ayanna Thompson uh, to call for a moratorium on Othello performances. So, um, you know, some stu a student actually uh, came to my office hours yesterday after we had this conversation in class and said, so, so what do we do, right? What are we left with? And I told him, I don't know. I'm going to ask Keith for you. So I'm asking you, Keith, what do you think? Should we still perform Othello today? Uh, and if so, how, right? How do we do Othello and do no harm, let alone do good? And as a director, how would you do it? It is, it is not the theater's job to do no harm. In fact, theater should be, should be free to interrogate anything and perhaps in that process do great harm. Uh, it is what we make of the harm that it does that moves us forward. So, you know, this, 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 this question comes up again and again, you know, I, I, I think we have, you know, again, Post George Floyd, everybody gets on that, you know, rides that zeitgeist of social justice and creative justice to uh, the, the nth degree and, and, and turn around and everybody's nervous to say or do anything that is going to be perceived as on the wrong side of this, this equation, this conversation. What I say to people is you should be nurturing your artist to make great art, what they perceive as great art, to interrogate deeply the human condition and hopefully discuss it and evolve it, you know, because we need a lot of help, right? Uh, 
what I think will happen is that the audience will evolve. You know, the audience is looking harder. You know, uh, we see you white American theater, which is this sort of uh, amorphous anonymous group of whoever who put this document into the world. It's this amazing thing. And everybody is reacting to this document. Nobody can really put their finger on who wrote it, you know? Um, uh, because what it's speaking is deep truth on every page. You know? This is how you've treated us, right? And we are aware and we are watching, right? We are watching what you do, right? So I say, do a fellow, but be prepared to be scrutinized and be prepared to defend your creative choices, right? I'm, I'm here to let you do, I, I will support them. I will support, you are the artist. I'm supposed, I love artists. That's what you're supposed to do. But you know, what, what, you, what, you, what shows up at the end of that, we're gonna look and we're gonna tell you what, 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 what you're manifesting and why. You know? And if you're doing great, we'll say you're doing great. And if not, we're gonna let you know that. So if you're ready to have those discussions, do it. It's a, it's a, it's a dog of a play. It's not, yeah, no, it's not. It's, I, I understand what, what Aya Thompson is saying. Um, I just don't I, 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 I don't feel like we shouldn't pick up and explore whatever might move us, move, move the needle. If you show me yet, you know, the, the, American Shakespeare is basically recycled. You know, we don't need another Hamlet unless you're doing something else, unless you're going deeper. We don't need another r &J unless you're going deeper in some way and finding something that I haven't seen. And, 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 and Othello is no different. And um, um, American Shakespeare generally just recycles plays. They don't do that work because recycling fits into the three to five week first rehearsal to stage model. That is cheap, right? They can, they, and they can pump out four, three plays in a season and all those people get, we were talking about before, get salaries, right? We're just doing that, right? We're not about making anything brilliant. When, when you start to want, really, really want to make things, make, make brilliant work, I'm gonna cut you some slack. Because I'll see where you're going deep and trying. I'll tell you where, you, where, where, where you've gone off the beam, where you're wrong, but I'm gonna respect you for trying. You know, let's look at all of it. You know, and let's have discussions about what we're getting right and what we're getting wrong. And we'll turn around one day and we'll see that our theater is a whole lot better you know, than we're letting it be right now. I don't, you know, I don't, I, 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 I don't need Harry Potter part nine. You know? I don't need, I don't, you know, I don't need three incarnations of Frozen. I don't need, you know, I don't need a whole lot that's, that, 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 that becomes the product that the industry is, 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 is selling. I wanna talk about us, you know. American War talks about us, right? Says you need to look at this. You, we need to discuss this. No, we're not gonna sing and dance today. We're gonna to talk about this. So talking about not recycle. So, sorry, just I wanted to uh, point out uh, that Brandy dropped the link in the chat to uh, the statement that Keith was mentioning. We see you, White American Theater. So if you're curious, just click it, read it. It's a fabulous document out there. Um, but talking about not recycling, doing something new or telling uh, those stories, those old stories better in a way that is about us, uh, I want to ask you about your new project because you have written a new adaptation of Othello right? Not a response like American Moore, an adaptation uh, that you're hoping to begin to workshop uh, uh, soon. Can you tell us a little bit about this adaptation and, um, and the ways in which it's, it's working with engaging with all the work you've done around uh, American Moore? How do you reject the white gaze with, with this adaptation? And when can I put it on my syllabus? <laughs> Well, in simplest terms, uh, I reject the white gaze by, by actually centering the eponymous hero, right? You know, we have this play called Othello, the Moor of Venice, but the, but, but the central character is the white villain who is just so brilliant that he overcomes this, 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 this African-American general, you know? And that's the story that Shakespeare wanted to tell, and I don't indict him for it. He had his reasons for telling whatever story he told, right? He's 400 years dead, I don't care. You know, he did what he needed to do. What are we doing now? You know, are we going to recycle? Are we going to tell that story? Are we going to tell an, an, a, another story? Uh, while 
American Moore was evolving, was coming along, I realized that if we did get it to Broadway, uh, which had, had been the goal, that there were going to be questions about Othello. When Othello? How are you, are you going to perform Othello? Are you going to direct Othello? And of course, my answer has always been, by and large, unless I really needed a job, I'm not, I'm not interested in this this, this this play. And anytime, no, there, there has been no good experience for me arising from this play, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, 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 and so, no. But I thought if I was going to engage the discussion, I should probably start to work on an adaptation of this work that I thought was remotely playable. Was in, 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 you know, in some way, uh, I could I could create this tragic arc and get this eponymous hero from beginning to end with some level of dignity. I have always said, I don't like Othello. I do not like him. I think he's reprehensible, but I care for him. Right. It's a very, 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 very important distinction. And I wanted to give Othello care. I wanted to give him agency. I wanted to give him uh, a mind that an audience could see working in this situation, a compromised mind that's compromised from the very beginning. Here you have this, this, this man who says, if we, we are to believe him, has been in, 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 in combat situations since he was nine years old. How much PTSD does this man have when we first see him, right? How compromised is, are his psychological facilities when we first see him, you know? How much work is he doing? How many calories is he burning to hold that together as he ages out, mm -hmm. right? And it's influencing these, these choices of his. Uh, and yet he is this general who is where he is because he has a calculating mind, a mind that can, can take in and process data and figure out directions to go. So my thought was, I'm, you know, and I'm not a fan of translation of, of Shakespeare, of changing the words, of updating any of that stuff. I mean, Shakespeare is Shakespeare. I, 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 I very much dislike that stuff, nor am I particularly a fan of concept, Shakespeare having to set it somewhere to make your point. You know, if you said it absolutely nowhere, and if you're telling the story of human beings on a stage, they will be human beings, you know, on a stage. And, um, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, help me. Uh, <laughs> you, you were talking about the, um, the uh, dealing with um, assessing how compromised the fellow is from the start. Yes. That's logically speaking. There's, some, there's something else. There was somewhere I was going and I, I lost it and I do that because I get excited and it all goes out the, way, <laughs> out the window. Um, the upshot, the upshot is, um, I needed to create real humanity, real multidimensional humanity of these characters, which Shakespeare does not give us. No, no, no. Harold Bloom will claim that he does. Harold Bloom will say Shakespeare gives us everything that we, we, we did that, that we need, and it's nonsense. No, Shakespeare gives us archetypes which need to be filled with the human beings that inhabit the, the historical moment that the play is being done in on some level, those sensibilities, mm -hmm. right? And it is a group of, of searching, needing uh, human beings that conspire to create this play, all with their own needs, all with their separate set of, of tools. You know, they're all very different, the characters in this play. When you really begin to create deep, meaningful, rich characterization, and uh, I can see a way, I can get to the end of this play and have an audience believe that right now we accept it, right? We accept, this is the play. We know how, we've read it. We've read it a hundred times. We know where this play goes, right? He kills his wife and then he kills himself and then we go home because we saw Shakespeare and we were entertained, right? That, that, <laughs> that has to stop. I have to get them to the end of the play and say, you know, this has happened in a way that I believe for the first time that is plausible for the first time. This makes sense. I have to create a, 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 an Othello and a Desdemona that the audience understands their love, sees their loves, feels, feels their dysfunction, but roots for them and hopes it, are, are caught up in the play enough that by the time we get to the end, they're thinking it might end differently, that the love might pull this out, right? Might be able to make something else happen. You know, can I catch them off guard? and have them remember, oh yeah, that's not the play. That's not the play they wrote, you know. Um, this takes really committed actors and a lot of 
of work in, 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 in rehearsal, you know, in a, in, a, in a workshopping space. And this process, again, this, this speaks to evolving theatrical practices and creative practices. You know, we are trying to find academic institutions that want to host a core, core group, create a group of 14 people for two week intervals uh, over the course of a year. So each institution would take, take us for two weeks and then we go home and marinate on the stuff that we did and come back somewhere else two weeks later, at least 16 weeks of that. So four months of rehearsal with no pressure at all to ever, nobody's talking about a production, no pressure at all to mount the production to create a performance, but just actors coming in the room and digging deep and making characters. And at the end of 16 weeks, you look at what has evolved. And if there's something there that looks like a new play, then you talk about putting that on a stage. If there's not, then we all get, got paid and we go home. You know, say so we done, we've done this, 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 this experiment, this work. That's what needs to happen. And of course, that means that my adaptation can evolve, if, if, if put in the hands of a group of dedicated actors, can evolve greatly from what I think it needs to be and might be something else entirely. And that's, that's the magic of ensemble working. And whatever that became would be the thing that you put in your syllabus. Well, does, first, that's very expire, inspiring. Second, let's keep talking because I would love for you to come here for two weeks with the ensemble and, and you know, to, to be part of that um, process. So we'll be in touch. Uh, I, it's, you know, it's so, it's, so, it's so embryonic right now. And, uh, we're, it, you know, I, I'm not sure how to reach out to the various uh, academic institutions that might be able to give us, uh, you know, resources to do that. But I imagine there's got to be eight nation, nation, nationwide that'll give us, you know, 16 weeks worth of, of work. Certainly, once you allow the actors, the, the, the artists to begin work like this, they become deeply dedicated very quickly because it's the work they all want to do, which, which the business model takes away from all of us. Mm -hmm. right? We never get that work. Mm -hmm. So it could be a very exciting thing. Absolutely. And I love the way you're connecting, you know, everything that is problematic about that is problematic or hard about doing Othello to the larger issues, the structure of productions and, and the ways in which you know, capitalism is, <laughs> is working this. So yes, we're going to work together. Let's keep talking behind the scenes. And this, this is the beginning of an adventure. I'm very excited about that. Um, I think it's time for us to switch to uh, the Q&A. And I see we have a lot of questions actually in, in the chat. So uh, I'm going to you know, ask the first question that I, that I can see as open and then we'll take it from there. So we have a question from uh, Sierra, a graduate student who's in, enrolled in Black Shakespeare. Early on in the play, I don't know if you can see those questions, Keith, uh, but if you click uh, on- The one in the Q&A? Q&A open, that's the top one from Sierra. I'm still going to read it out loud. Uh, early on in the play, you write slash discuss the notion that there seems to be a separation from white audience members and theater creators that they are not in the play. It may seem like a straightforward statement, but I'm hoping you can share more about what you mean by this. In what ways do white folks engage with Othello in a way that suggests they do not see themselves in the play, yet are? Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't think that we've discussed this a little bit. I don't think that white Americans in generally see themselves in anything. We don't talk about whiteness like we talk about blackness or other ethnicity because it is the normative. It is the default being. You know, to be white is normal in America. I'm not in anything. I'm not part of anything. I'm just a guy living my life. I go, to, I get up, I go to work, I do my stuff. I'm like everybody else. You know, it, 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 it is this, the insidious nature of, 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 of white supremacy and the growth and, 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 and uh, fomenting and nurturing of white supremacist culture in America that has allowed white people, uh, force them generally, generally speaking. I mean, certainly there are, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's, it, 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 I don't mean to sound monolithic, but what is, what is monolithic is the structure of, of, of money and power in, 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 in America. It truly is. So there are people within it who shift one way or the other, but basically the structure that encompasses us makes us what we are. And uh, so the director uh, in, the, in the play, uh, he does not, he does has, he has no recognition of the moment he's caught up in. This is not what he was taught. He was taught that actors are happy to have a job. 
that black actors are happy to play Othello, that, 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 that Othello looks and acts a particular way. And these are all his, his, his defaults, his normative, you know, so he has, he has no clue when you break that fourth wall, when you, when you invade that in any way, whether it's in the theater or out in life, when you, when you blow that stuff up, white people react sometimes very violently, right? Because they cannot afford to believe that this is something other than generations of their people have been living. They, they literally cannot afford to, 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 to buy into something else. You know, this is how it is. And we see that now. We see the, 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 the culture shifting, browning, right? The American culture is browning rapidly. And they are about to, to fade into the minority. And look at the mayhem. Right, the grasping, the reaching, the 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 the, the fearful insanity. This is terror, right? right? That you see white America uh, evincing in the face of this, because they never knew that they were part of something that could change, right? Um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> it certainly does, <laughs> and um, I'm I'm you know I'm, I'm trying to move through the questions because we have so many excellent ones, but um, I noticed one that I want to ask you because it's directly connect because it's a good question and also because it's directly connected to another course I'm teaching right now about representations of Islam in early modern England. Othello is on the syllabus. So the question we have is, I am curious as to what you interpret the name of the play American Moore me, to mean. Of course, it is a reference to Othello, but the word more carries not only racial meanings, but religious meanings too, as well as connoting a specific region of the world. So I wonder what an American more might mean. Does the name of the play address the position of Islam in America? Uh, it does not uh, necessarily. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the early moderns in this process of, of, of trying to define themselves uh, began to do it by, by defining what they were not and who they were not, right? Um, we're, we, 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 we are white Christians, you know, of, of, of one stripe or another. We are not Jews, we are not Muslims, we are not, these are all other things and, 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 and they can't be good. If this is good, there can't be something as equally good as us, right? And that's just the 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 the, the, the Eurocentric, the Engl the Anglocentric uh, model, and the term "more" uh, at some point in that process was adopted to mean just about any. It was a pejorative to 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 define just about anybody who was not white and Christian. You know, you could you could you could refer to a Jew as a, as as a more. You could refer to uh, 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 any brown skinned Muslim as a Moor or, or African black man, you know, as a Moor and any and number of things in between. So he was that, that the Moor was always the other, right? And in keeping with the metaphor between Othello and um, uh, American Moor, I felt like this American black man, you know, it's, it's Othello the Moor of Venice, right? And here we have this actor who is the Moor of America, right? That was that was that was the juxtaposition of those two. That was that was my intent, you know. Um, the questions of Islam in the play again, when we talk about adaptations of of this play, I think there's an a, a, an exploration there. I mean, so much. So much of Shakespeare's language speaks to this this, this, this Christian idea, this Christian. Uh, Ethic and sensibility, and I, I, I don't necessarily buy it. I don't, I don't. I, you know, the, the the Venetians hired mercenaries from all over the place to fight their wars uh, because they had money and they didn't want to fight them themselves, and so they would have had to have been dealing with people from other cultures. And I think, you know, uh, if it were if it were up to me to play Othello, I think that uh, a, a strong vocabulary in, 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 in Christian phraseology and doctrine would be helpful if I if I had it to appease my employers, my paymasters, who were Christians, you know. So I think a lot of that is for their benefit and not his. We don't really know 
uh, we, you know, you again, you have to have to build that in the creation of, 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 of the character. We have this scene with the handkerchief where he's discussing uh, something something metaphysical and, 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 and pagan, you know, in his past. And what is that and what does that mean to him? You know, that, that's something for, for, for exploration, which gives him dimension and depth. Um, is he a Muslim? I think his people were at one point, you know, because I think, I think they came from North Af Africa via the, the, the uh, Iberian Peninsula and hung out there for, for 700 years before he was, he was even born. And um, their language is mixed with Spanish. There was a strong Jewish culture over which they, they ruled and there was a great tolerance of the Jewish culture. There, uh, are, there is some scholarship that talks of, 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 about the possibility of Othello's name being a, a, a Hebraic name you know, really juicy stuff to look at and play with and, 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 and play with. Um, uh, then there was the Reconquista and the Moorish diaspora went off into Europe after having given basically the light of the world to the, to the dark ages, right? You know, you know, here's, this is, you know, here's, here, here's, here's, look, here's how to bathe, you know, here's, how to, you know, here's, here's science for you. Here's how to write a poem. Right, brought all that stuff to, to 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 Europe, and then became this sort of wandering people in that awakened Renaissance Europe. Right. Um, what does that make him? How many how many languages has he learned to speak before he's gotten there and, and started to speak Italian? You know, mm -hmm. and how well does he speak it? What's lost in translation? Right, that 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 creates misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Right. All sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff to look at. But I think you know, I, I, I get excited and go off on tangents. But the short, the, 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 the short answer is, I, I can't, I cannot but believe that there is Islam throughout Othello's Othello's past, Othello's heritage and history. Thank you. We have a couple of questions. We're getting back to the question of the audience. We have two questions that are, you know, phrased differently, but about the kind of spectators that you've got. So we have one question from Andres about um, academic audiences, right? I'm just going to excerpt part of the question. Um, while systemic racism pervades both, you know, academia and, uh, and the commercial theater, I wonder about the different confrontations with so-called expertise such as the narrow-minded director in American Moore or a Shakespeare or theater professor, right? Does the legacy of white supremacy stubbornly tethered to Shakespeare manifest in specific ways in commercial theater versus university stages? So can you tell us about your experience encountering, you know, academic audiences, right? What are they? they you, you've been very clear about the, the ways in which academia has embraced American Moore, but what are the specific uh, dynamics of spectating that comes with an academic audience, right? Forms of resistance that you can possibly have there. And well, I mean, again, the, you know, engaging with academic audiences, there is this tendency towards, there is this, you know, due to people like uh, Kim Hall and Ayanna Thompson, there is this now growing, you know, circle of uh, race theorists and Shakespeare and race scholars, right, um, that are all talking back to this and speaking loudly and saying, hey, this is ours too. And this is what, you know, I don't know if you know this was there, but here it is, you know. Uh, and that, like everything else changing, is frightening. And I'm sure there's a segment of pedagogy that if, if you're engaging with an audience of people who are, who, who are overwhelmingly uh, positive, enthusiastic, you're not going to hear from them. They're not going to get up in that setting and say, this is nonsense. You know, Shakespeare is this, and 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 we are this. They may feel that. They may believe that. They may be uh, uh, trepidatious, worried that their time is evolving, that the time is passing. Um, and I think it is. I think so much of the thought around this work, given the browning of the culture, given that there are always more young academics and and theater people coming up. To, to, to evolve this. When I talk to 
people in 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 either place, mostly mostly young actors, you know, at, at actor training institutions. I say, look, this is all about you. The theater that we have made sucks. It's this is what we've got. We're not going to make it better. This is what we've left you. You're going to have to evolve it. You're going to have to. If theater is your thing, you're going to have to do things that change it so that we evolve as a culture. And that's true in academia as 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 well. It's new thought. It's new ideas, right? It's new minds free to 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 do this work. And of course, they are impeded, right? They are repeated because they don't have the money to go to school, they don't have the food to think right, you know, <laughs> very often, right? They don't have the access on any number of levels, you know, to this work, but it's changing, right? Because more and more people are just struggling to, 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 to do the work, to, 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 to show up and get their education and, 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 and make some kind of a stamp on, on, on what this is. So if I understood the question, yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is present in, in, in all of the above, but there is nothing for us to do, but continue to think progressively, begin, continue to think our thoughts and engage these discussions, right? And support one another, right? And create opportunities for one another to advance this work. We frighten a lot of people. We frighten, we frighten a lot of people, you know? You're not supposed to be, you're not supposed to be smart, right? You're not supposed to be I can't, I can't even, you know. <laughs> I love it. I, I feel you. Um, but so I guess if I, if I rephrase my question is, did you find academics to be good listeners? Are we better listeners than, than the director that you get here overall? Well, I think you are. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I find that the people who have picked up and run with this play in, 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 in various ways. I think, I think Kim Hall is about to give a lecture in Toronto in a week or two uh, around this play and, and Tony Morrison's Desdemona. Um, these, these people are listening because they have uh, incentive to, that it means something to them. It is what they're talking about. It is what they have dedicated their lives to. You know? um, is everybody listening that way? You know, I, 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 I don't mean to suggest that there are no quite academics listening. There are those too, and those that are, 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 are expressing and realizing in sort of big ways that if they are going to be teaching this next generation of students, that they have to find ways to be more available, to, to look inward, to, to figure out where they sit in all this work. So that's happening. You know, I have not, I, I have had the good fortune not to be exposed to all that many people uh, pushing back in 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 harsh and, and and sort of closed down ways. I will say, however, that you know, the making of the theater piece, the making of the evolving, the showing up and doing this play, you know, as we go forward, remains hard. So that is, you know, that's a resistance. That's a violence, right? That's a way of pushing back that the American industry is showing me. Saying no, we're not. You know, I've I, I've sat across desks of, of producers who said, "So who's this director? Who's this guy supposed to be?" It's not me, and I, and I'm sitting there. Basically, we're playing the play, right? We're there in the play, and I can't say what he needs to hear. Uh, all I can say, oh, yeah, no, it's uh, that's not you. You know, if that you don't think it's you, it's not you. And then I'll say things like, "Well, you know, you don't have to take my ideas, but you know, yeah, I got a couple of suggestions. You know, what if?" You changed this and did did that. Now you know you don't have to take my idea. And what he's really saying is, if you're going to play this in my theater, you're not going to indict me. You're going to make me feel good about this because I'm not I'm not I'm not handing this to my audience, which I've nurtured for 40 years and I make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, uh, you know, catering to them. You know? And these are important. These are the important guys. These are the gatekeepers. These are the everything that's good and right and progressive. Uh, you know. Uh, in, in American theater, how they hold themselves up, right? And, 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 and that's the way they talk, you know, that's the way they look at this work. This is frightening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, the shit, it scares the shit out of people. <laughs> I believe it. We have time for one last question, which is again about, you know, different kinds of audiences. Uh, that's a, a question from Abby. Uh, were there conversations with other black actors or theater artists, possibly including those who had played Othello, which if I understand correctly, would mean most black actors or theater artists, right? As you developed and performed American more, right? Did, did those fellow black actors familiar with playing Othello, did their reactions differ from non-actor audience members or just how did they respond? 
you know? How did fellow black actors respond? How are they responding still to the play? Uh, well, by and large, because, because this is at its, at its root, the experience of an African-American Shakespeare, Shakespearean actor, uh, most, most black American actors, you know, who are, 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 are you know, black men see themselves, see, the, see, see this, this is real. This is not, this is not a made up truth. This isn't a whimsical set of, 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 of you know, ideas here, you know. These are to a great extent facts. This is how it works. And, you know, there was, there has been pushback again, back to producers who say, well, can the, can the, can the actor and the director have a more extensive discussion? And, and I would say- You give me more well, space. <laughs> yeah, I would say they could if that's actually how it happened, but nothing in my experience is that. This is what it is. I'm showing you truth and you want to make it something else because like so much of America, we want to rewrite our truth. We want to say, this is who we are, not this thing that we actually are, but let's write it like this. Let's, let's create this narrative about ourselves. And again, you poke holes in that and people get you know, very, very, very worried and upset. Um, and the, the, the black actors who come to see the show, you know, male and female uh, actors, uh, recognize this experience very acutely. And I have talked to, you know, there are, there, there, there are colleagues of mine who, you know, I brought it to as I was, I was working on it and put it in front of them, said, read this, and, you know, um, and, 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 and they would. So there was a lot of encouragement there on that front. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you know Deborah Ann Bird, by any chance? I know her because we, we I saw her perform her piece. Uh, via Zoom, uh, some some something, and then we had a, a conversation with. Uh, there's a online guy calls himself New York Shakespeare, and he has an online thing, and had a conversation with the two of us at, at, at one point. So yes, I do. Okay. Great. Well, because, um, you know, you know that already, but I want to remind everybody that, um, you know, our next event, the, the third installment of the Black Baroque series will feature precisely uh, Deborah Ann Bird, and that will take place this Monday at 6 p.m. But for now, I want to thank you, Keith. This was a wonderful, vital conversation. Uh, this is just the beginning. As, as you pointed out, you're uh, de currently developing this new adaptation of Othello and, and we want to be part of that. So this in, is to be continued. In addition to that, I think what's about to happen is that uh, Point Park University in Pittsburgh, down by your colleague, Kim, my director, who is at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Point Park is connected with the Pittsburgh Playhouse. And it looks like this spring of 2022 will be the first emergence of a live performance of American Moor again. And, uh, you know, there will have been nothing since Cherry Lane fall of 2019. Um, and maybe some creation of that momentum again. So look out for that because we would really love to move it to any major venues, you know, after, after starting not to do a one-off down there, but to move it to, you know, four or five, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, major, major, major venues. I, 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 don't, I don't know how any of that's going to work, but that's what's, that's what's in the pipe. That, that sounds amazing. And I'm sure, you know, there are lots of venues in Chicago. So we want to get you here. It's going to happen. <laughs> I want to thank you for now and um, remind everybody that on Monday, the interview uh, of uh, Deborah Ann Bird will be conducted by my colleague Gabriel Rendell Bent, who is the co-director of the upcoming production of Othello at the Court Theatre. So she'll be in conversation with, with Deborah Ann and she will tell us all about her new show, Becoming Othello, A Black Girl's Journey. Um, we are going to end it now. Thanks again, uh, Keith, for coming and talking to us. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into this event. I know it's late in the day, but uh, I feel really privileged to uh, have been in your presence, Keith, and to have gotten those wonderful questions from everyone. Thanks again to uh, Brandy for making this event possible and run smoothly. Thank you, everybody, and be well. <laughs>